might have overbought a little bit, so you're welcome to have usually the case. as much as you want. Mm -hmm. Usually the case, I'm not even referring to it. Is it regular sauce or is it white? White sauce. Oh, yeah. That one's spinach, Alfredo, chicken, tomato. Spinach, Alfredo, chicken, tomato. That's like a mouthful. <laughs> We've actually been averaging about 10. I think this one was in the works. Or yeah, that one is um, not the works. That's the Papa John's version of it, but it, it's a ex extravaganza. So oh. it's a yeah, I saw it. It was funny because I was I was looking at that one over the weekend, and I kept wanting to say extra, extra like uh, vegan or something. I don't know. I couldn't read it right. It was like no matter what how I looked at it, I'm like now start reading the ingredients. I'm like never mind. This is not vegan at all. Extra <laughs> <laughs> <Mr>. vegan, yeah. <laughs> Joined yet. I, I know we have one um, person who's a remote worker, works mm -hmm. down in Orlando. Is it Orlando? Or? Yeah. Yeah, like nearby. He actually lives in Delta. Del Delta. Oh, the beach is already here, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you gotta get some. Right here. Mm -hmm. You like VPN in? Um, I don't know if he does VPN in. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Has your DevOps, you know. Oh, uh, that's right. Okay, just does that through that thing. Mm -hmm. I think this is the people. That's good. You've got everything local. Right. Mm -hmm. So you got if you do you use Azure DevOps as your source control area? Yeah. Oh. We had some on premises servers for TFS. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember when exactly that phased out. Hey. You got rid of them, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have them as just like for archival. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything current is Azure DevOps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was it's it's been around. It, it's just they just changed the name. Anybody want water? Want water? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I didn't know it was a second phrase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but, um, yeah, I just started using it. A friend of mine recommended it because I was uh, I used to do some like before that. Like I used to like uh, what was I doing? Like between I, well, what it was we had like different people that were playing around with stuff, and so like I had set up like a Dime DNS server and. Yeah. I had like, you know, went through my router and changed the port forwarding, you know, that stuff so they could sort of use one of my machines as sort of like a server or whatever. I had all that set up or whatever, but like that was a while back or whatever. Now, but something like that it's like, it seems like it would be a lot easier. Yeah. Well, that's the nice thing, of at least for us, you know, having a lot of free stuff in Azure. And even if it's not free, it's, it's relatively low cost. Because mm -hmm. um, you can just stand something up in seconds. And yeah. You have some your solution up and running. And, Publicly accessible, or you can limit it to a certain network or IP range. Yeah, wonder what, how long it take for DoD to transfer to something like that. <laughs> that might be Pete. Does that mean it's time to start? <laughs> Alberto. Do I? Or I sit upstairs. Maybe he's hanging out with Dobson at home. See. Is this one going to be remote? This one, what do you mean remote? Is somebody doing it remotely or were you doing it? No, I'm still doing it. Oh. But um, we do have a guy who works remote, but he's actually going to be here next month. Um, he was at the last meeting. He was at the yeah. Marshall, he had a British accent. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I just remember y'all talking about being remote or something. I didn't know. Well, we're going to do a live stream of this one today, mm. and this is going to be kind of a trial run to see how it goes. He's doing it next month, right? So he will be giving it remotely. He was talking about uh, before. He will be here for the award banquet. Yeah. He was maybe going to do it remotely, but now that he's going to be here that week anyways, he's going to present test trip. Where does he come from? Orlando. Orlando. He was the CTO of a startup called, uh, I forget what it's called, not e-meals, that's something else, Modern Meal. It's a meal planning service that goes into like highly specific nutrition requirements for meals, like an analyzing recipes for nutritional requirements. So he was talking about it. He's probably looking at it then. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, it is on it. It's the keto diet or something. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, I just, I work remote and I just come back from my um, the company I work for. I'm so glad to be back. Mm -hmm. I spent all last week up there. Where was it at? D.C. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, hate, I hate being in that place. Yeah, I just don't like areas that are like extremely high traffic or whatever. It's just not fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I probably spend more money Ubering around every place than I do staying in a hotel. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. They reimburse you, of course. Yeah, they reimburse me, but. Yeah. That's um, probably what I'd do there if I was in a big city like that. I was in like Dallas Fort Worth uh, a couple weeks ago or whatever, and that was about the, about my living or whatever. Like, it wasn't too bad, you know. Like, you guys don't seem that bad to me whenever I go there. Mm -hmm. I was actually more in the Fort Worth area, so like it was even easier. <laughs> but D.C. is just so crazy. It's just like you can't go, you know, five miles, it takes you an hour. Yeah. You know? It's like. Yeah. I, I don't like places like that. Yeah, it's like it takes me an hour to get five miles. <laughs> like Miami, right? Yeah, when I lived in Miami, sometimes I'd go to work on a Sunday <clears throat> real early, and I could drive it Sunday morning. I get there in 12 to 15 minutes mm -hmm. uh, during the weekdays, 45 minutes to an hour and a half and things Depending were crazy. Yeah, there's a wreck. You might <laughs> there was a wreck, yeah. Mm -hmm. No way around it. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's like the water, sometimes 40 minutes, sometimes three hours. Mm -hmm. just four yeah, minutes. That, that's in right. In the summertime, yeah. you can just hang it up. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, You're almost better off just like staying in town until mm -hmm. eight or nine. Five I literally... Six. Mm -hmm. Come through Destin one day during the summer, this last summer, and spent two hours trying to get through. Yeah, it's crazy there. Yeah. Over here. Yeah, my home like, criteria oh my God, is really like. I would never go that not, way again anything in, that, in the summertime. I, I try to avoid 98 like at all costs, so like I always try to live somewhere where I never have to go to 98, like, <laughs> unless I'm like, like potentially trying to go somewhere. <laughs> crazy. Sometimes you're better going up through Crestview, going mm -hmm. over depending on time of day. Mm -hmm. That's like when I come here, even though it's probably not that bad, I still go up the interstate and then come back across that way so I can skip all of 98. Safer that way. Mm -hmm. But then I still get hung up right there going across the bridge out of Pensacola because it's like right at time for everybody to get off work and it's backed up across the bridge. and mm -hmm. living pacing up. They're all coming back from Pensacola. Yeah. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where are you streaming this to? Um, it's called Zoom. Do you use Zoom? Mm -hmm. Meeting platform. They, uh, is it is it being recorded or are you just streaming it and anybody that wants to join in? It is being it? recorded, yeah. And then I'm I'm thinking we'll do something. They they provide links, so they mm -hmm. may use that or something like YouTube or right. um, whatever makes the most sense, I guess, for archival. And I could maybe append like a like the PowerPoint file somewhere in there. Yeah. We use, uh, well, if it's in-house, we use Microsoft Teams for everything. Mm -hmm. But if there's something bigger than that can handle, then we use uh, like GoToMeeting or something. Or with it. GoToMeeting's expensive. But yeah. it's, it's a good product. It's just really. Nice. It works good. Mm -hmm. It works better than most of the stuff I use on base. <laughs> Which rarely works at all. <laughs> and you're already, uh, I think it's called like, is it DCS or something like that. There's something we use on base a lot that's it's awful. For military specific? Yeah, yeah military. Like, they have like these web meetings and it's like some kind of government like thing. It's awful. Like, you know, with never encrypted video. Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually like you're lucky you can get a connection at all. Well, I'm, a, I'm assuming that the government's networks are also terrible because we never do any like live thing like that with the government. They always just go to their office mm. or they come to our office. Yeah, they're pretty terrible. Yeah. It's across the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or, you know, they're just down the road mm -hmm. from them, but they never like do like a video conference. Yeah. It's good one of them just goes to the other one. Yeah, it's probably still got that kind of that old school mentality of just yeah. go face to face, sit around mm -hmm. the table. He said he's not going to be able to join. 
we'll, we'll have the recording soon. Mm. I should go ahead and go for it. No, because you changed the start time to 6.30. People waiting. Mm. Yeah. I thought you were going to, but it still said 6 o'clock in there. Yeah, everybody can meet yeah. up. I realized it at 3. <laughs> and I, I went ahead and updated it for the heck of it. But <laughs> well, when I got the, the um, thing telling me that it was coming up, yeah, it said 7 o'clock. And I'm like, oh, wow. Oh, he must have moved it back, but I, I forgot I was in Eastern Time Zone. Yeah. And it was since. And then the day I looked at it, said 6 o'clock, and I was like, 6 o'clock? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll have to make sure I start putting CST on it, too, when that was yeah. streaming. Like it's people in Australia watching. That's right, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Early risers or something. Mm -hmm. Did you know that there are time zones that are only, like, that are off by like 30 minutes instead of an hour. Yeah, time zones are tough to nail down. I think there's a couple of odd ones around there. My son was over in Afghanistan and they were nine and a half hours difference hmm. instead of like 10 hours. And I was looking at it and some of those countries are like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, different things like that. You have to worry about daylight savings too, like the context of that day, is it daylight savings or not? <laughs> but where yeah. your house is like right on the line, like you know, saying where it's like five o'clock on one side of the house and six on the other. Then you, know? <laughs> you, you got more time than the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> You're if running you late. That. Just pick the lower time. And yeah. <laughs> I'm I, sorry. I was on the east one today. <laughs> I used to work for the state of Florida, and there's a lot of people that live like over there at the river in Chattahoochee. Yeah. Chattahoochee River. It's probably the majority of the and states. They lived on the central time, but they all went by eastern time. Even though they were in central. <clears throat> you have to like manually set your phone to like the whole the whole little communities and all would be on the central time, but they would all just go by eastern time. Where was this at? It's right up right up the road, you know, like before you get to Tallahassee. There's like all these little communities along the river. I didn't realize down. Fort St. Joe is eastern. Like I thought, I thought you had to go all the way to Tallahassee, but it's quite a bit before. <laughs> yeah, you, you, when you cross the uh, Chattahoochee River, that's when that's the line. Yeah. And that river runs all the way down, you know, to the Gulf. So everything probably probably, uh, probably gets confused because I know I've been up near Canada, like on the north end of Washington State, mm -hmm. and it'll think you're in Canada before you're, you're not technically in Canada, but your phone will get confused. It's already like, hey, uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, let's charge you some extra money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, all you got to do if you're going to go to Canada is just call your provider. And I think it's like a little bit more, but just tell them you're going to be in Canada and then it don't cost you a whole bunch of money when you go up in there. Because hmm. I'm not even sure if they charge you more. My parents used to do it all the time. And they would just call up AT and T and say, "Hey, we're going into Canada." Well, I guess North America is different than if you go to Europe. Yeah. Ideally, I get over there. You, you're probably better off just getting um, SIM cards and a little prepaid phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or you Wi-Fi wherever you can. Yeah, I used um, Google Voice and it, <laughs> on Wi-Fi, and it just generates a phone number for you. So people can't call you, but you can call anybody in the world for mm -hmm. um, cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the people use like WhatsApp, and there's another voice app that people use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Off through Facebook. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right there, mm -hmm. The cool thing with Google Voice was I could tell it where I wanted to be sourced from, so I could like mm -hmm. make up my own area codes and stuff, and like make reservations as if I were actually from the country. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. You just about do that with a cell phone these days. Yeah. Well, Todd, you got me where I'm not feeling so bad about uh, how much I'm paying for this floor. Oh, I would have gladly paid four thousand more to have somebody else do that. That's that's the hardest. But you did fourteen hundred square foot all tile, right? Yeah, that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> what is the third? Knee pads. <sighs> 
That's, yeah, D pads. <laughs> I came prepared, but it was still the worst thing I've ever tried to do. Yeah. Could you imagine doing that ten hours a day, every day? Well, I I might kill myself. If that's all I had to go for, I mean, you'd really have to take. I mean, I don't know how anybody can do that into their thirties. My uncle, I had an uncle that did it. Oh, really? Yeah, that's what What's he did. Even worse is people that do carpet. Mm-hmm. Said they're he kicking physical hell. Yeah, he was. He was actually. Um, he was sure. actually like a. a he had to wait all the time, stuff like that. And I think real good shape. You'd really have to be in good shape. Yeah. 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 Take care of all the like, mansions and all kinds of stuff. Or put that stuff down like that. I should have. For some reason, I. I just wanted some mm-hmm. tile. Mm-hmm. Bought a new house. Bought I don't know how you did it here because I've done a few myself. And it's it as soon as I started. You can get tile that snap what? Like a floating floor? <sighs> yeah, I make some mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and you can put that stuff down in no time flat. <laughs> just go. I've gotten some estimates, though. I can wow. understand why you did it yourself. It costs a lot around here to get anybody to do it. <laughs> I was like, 10 grand, no way. So when I, after it was all said and done, it cost me five. I was like, mm-hmm. that's still a lot of money. And you were like, it might have been worth it. <laughs> oh, it would have definitely been worth it. Yeah, I mean, um, a lot of people try to, like, I've got estimates, and I'm kind of new new to the area in terms of, like, you know, being used to the foundation or whatever. Everybody was like, oh, we don't, you know, we take this tile up, we don't know if it's going to, how much leveling we have to do, and that could, that could run, you, you could literally run yourself another 10 grand just trying to level the floor back out. And I'm like, <laughs> What? <laughs> they go buy some self-leveling concrete and pour it in there and say, okay, it's mm-hmm. level. Come on, let's do it. Yeah, yeah they told me my floor. <laughs> I just went and just did it. Yeah. Bad. What kind of tile did you put in? Like the planks or uh, just regular tile? Or? It's a big, um, it's, it's kind of like what they have in the kitchens and stuff here. Mm-hmm. Almost exactly like that. Mm-hmm. I did that. I made that mistake one time with a metal roof. I thought, oh, I can do that. Can do a metal roof? No problem. <laughs> well, I did it. Oh, wow. That killed me, but I did it. <laughs> yeah. I had like one helper, you know, and that was it. Just going up there, putting that stuff up, man. Man, I saw the guys doing my roof and like grabbing a bunch of things and going up the ladder mm-hmm. with with that in their hand. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, my legs hurt just doing it, you know, just mm-hmm. watching it, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. the middle roof, it was not bad as far as that goes because, you know, I ordered the metal pre cut to. The, the links that it needed to be all the way across, and uh, but I forget it was like twelve thousand or twenty thousand screws in that thing. I calculated, but oh, I was like, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just crazy. Oh, it took me forever. You know, on a slant, I couldn't. I guess you could use you know the stand up. When you stand up, you just drill gun or whatever for like screwing in boards on a dock or something. I don't know if you could do that on a house. No, I just had the handheld, you know, zzz, zzz. but I did buy one with the clutch and all that built into it. So I go, I just go, zzz, 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 and it would stop automatically when it hit, you know, but it was a lot of screws, man. I had bags and bags of those damn screws. Yeah, you definitely save a lot doing it yourself. Yeah, I put that roof on. It costed me $3,500. If I had a it would have been like ten grand Damn. or more to get somebody else to do it. But yeah. It was a lot of work. And yeah, that's the kind of math that makes me do stupid, yeah. stupid things like tile your house or yeah. like roof it. God, no, I would. All I want to do is go home one day and then go here it is, and I open the door. It looks like nice and new, and you know. <laughs> well, you can if you shut out some cash. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> Problem with me is I, I now I used to do that kind of stuff, you know, I put the floor <laughs> down and all that. Now I walk in there and I go, that's not really that bad. <laughs> <laughs> the wife, she's always talking. We need to do this. I look at, looks fine to me. It's all right. Yeah. I'm like, I don't want to spend the money and I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like even though I'm spending the money, it's still a headache on me. Because I got to clear the furniture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. matter of fact, there's some pieces of furniture they just will not move. If it's too heavy or it's a big bed or whatever, they just won't move. So I said, you can move this, that, and the other. Well, if you're moving 10 pieces and all you're looking at left are little end tables, well, hell, I might as well just move those too. You know? yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I guess I'm going to go ahead and get started. Let's go do for it. it. Right. I won't be talking about how to replace tile today. 
Oh man. Topic. <laughs> Spring cleaning. Um, so I, the topic I, I named on Meetup is a little bit misleading. I know I said in .NET Core applications, like I've done in everything, but I'm more focusing on Meetup itself. So this is not tied to any one particular technology, but you could just as easily use it in a core application, ASP, you know, standard framework application, um, or, you know, express server-side kind of Node.js apps too. React. React. That'd be a good one for a feature. I've yeah. never done any React. Yeah, on the last project that I was working on, the React, the whole nine yards. <laughs> I'd like. I didn't. Didn't like React? I hate, I hate JavaScript. <laughs> it's an acquired taste. It's like six ways to do everything. You know, you never know which way to do it, or the way, way that somebody else is going to want it, or the way the Internet Explorer does it. <laughs> yeah, you just have to forget Internet Explorer. Yeah. You just try to do it for everything else. Well, that's where uh, Webpack now comes in, though. It'll comp uh, babble. It'll yeah. compile it down to whatever level you want it compiled down to. So you can make it compatible with Internet Explorer or whatever. That's what we yeah. use Webpack, Babel, React, the whole. Babel loader, plugin. Yeah, everything. And uh, I've been using TypeScript as well a lot lately because they, they have that natively. Um, whenever you compile it, you can set a target to ES3, ES5, whatever your goals oh, yeah. are. So it has a transpiler built yeah. into it. It may be behind the scenes using Babel, but it's, it's basically that. Probably is. Yes. Um, so I'm basically going to go through what is a module in JavaScript? Because that's what a lot of this stuff is. It's a static module bundler. Um, so talking about that whole idea of a module in JavaScript, how that compares maybe to C Sharp for reference, um, Webpack itself, and basically going through their core concepts, which is taken straight from their getting started guide, um, which I then went through. And so I'm going to show a technical demo of some of the things that I learned while doing that, and some of the gotchas with it. Um, and then kind of an open discussion, if there's any questions after that or anything you'd want want to see illustrated. So in C Sharp, we have obvious modules like namespaces or DLLs, um, things that you could kind of see and quantify. But with JavaScript, you've got these files that it's hard to tell on the surface um, with just basic JavaScript and HTML where they're being referenced without some sort of a framework for understanding that. So uh, since it's not compiled, that, that's part of the issue. You have all these files that are having to run at runtime in, in order, and you, you just hope that it lines up correctly. And that's where a lot of the browsers just haven't caught up. And you have things like Node.js, so if you're working on server-side JavaScript, if you've done any of that stuff, you can use some compilation concepts, require asynchronous module loading there, but it's not really something that's caught up natively in the browser quite yet. And so that's where Webpack comes in. Um, it's, it's taking all these bundles and actually with Webpack, not just JavaScript bundles, but you can even be bundling your images, your CSS, and uh, it's got a lot of really cool syntax for that. Things like font files, and it'll compress them, do any sort of loading logic you might need to do, um, and you can write it in JavaScript. So you could just import a CSS file and that ends up being loaded in the HTML. And it just handles that behind the scenes. Um, and I'm just going to step through these kind of sequentially of what the core concepts are that you need to know to get started with it. And then we'll show some examples of how those work. And I actually made a GitHub repo as well. So that way afterwards you could go and kind of pull that down if you wanted and you could see how some of the changes worked. Um, and I can get started here. So um, by default, you don't have to have any sort of special config file or anything fancy to, to get it up and running. You just have to have NPM or Node installed on your computer, and you have to install the Webpack package. Um, by default, if you create a file called source slash index, it's then going to push whatever you put in that file, any imports you use, things like that, out to an output which we'll talk in the next slide, but you can define it manually with some syntax like this in a webpack config file, which you can then either name the default name, which is webpack.configuration.js, or you can name it custom things and pass it in directly from the CLI. Um, or if you're doing anything with, with NPM, like you have package.json with some scripts, 
you can actually set a script named Webpack or named production or development or different environment types and then pass different configurations to it. You have an output, so that's where by default it's going to go out to a place like that, but you can totally customize that. Um, in this case here, it's going to take the directory name where this configuration file is located and then append dist to it. So, you know, in this case, that would be the root of a project. You could have that maybe in a Webpack folder and you have all your Webpack related stuff there, whatever makes the most sense. And then this is what you're going to name the output. And so if you had just one of these, obviously it'd be file.js. Whatever you've done in there, as far as imports and bundling is concerned, is going to go out to this one file. But you can also have multiple entries. And uh, say you had app.js, but then you also had, you know, some other JS file. You can use then an array syntax in here. And then if it's in the same config file in the same little section, you can output them and bundle them together like that too. Then the other concept you have here is loaders. So these are kind of like what you would think of as um, if you ever have used gulp before or grunt or any of these task runners, and you have to require something to get, to get it to run a certain task. Say you're compiling TypeScript, you have to require gulp TypeScript. Or if you're compiling SAS, gulp SAS. So they've got SAS, but then there's gulp SAS. Um, it's the same concept here, except it's a lo they, they, they have loader at the end, usually. So they have file loaders, you know, CSS loaders, image loaders. So different things you can use in Babel, I believe, is a loader. So you could use that as a way of processing things that match that regular expression. So .js, for example. Um, and then this is very similar to loaders. So plugins, almost the same thing, except the difference is plugins do anything the loaders don't do. Um, and I, I still didn't, didn't, didn't really find a line like where you could say something's a plugin versus a loader, other than obviously you define them different places. Um, but the basic idea is a loader is interpreting files, like it's mapping something, whereas a plugin is doing some helper function. So you could have a helper plugin that cleans your output directory, kind of like clearing the bin in a C Sharp project, but it's going to do that for all your, your distributed files or your bundles. And you can do other things like minification, mapping in there with plugins. Mode um, is basically your environment. So this is like debug or release. And it actually sets the node process environment as well so that you can have that variable for other uses. And you can set this either as a flag in the CLI, if you're calling it explicitly like that, or you can have different files where one says mode production, one says mode development, things like that. And you could parameterize those. And this is the last one um, of just like the core concepts that they cover, browser compatibility. So Webpack actually depends on this idea of a promise, which you have in, in C Sharp with async and await, but they've implemented it in, uh, in ES5. So anything IE8 or older requires some sort of a polyfill to get that to work. But there's plenty of documentation out there for that stuff with Babel. And this is an example of how you could import it. And then it's going to actually bundle that as part of it. It's not importing as something. Usually in JavaScript, if you see this syntax, you would say import, say dollar sign as jQuery, and that's where you get that dollar sign syntax. Well, this, if you just describe it literally, it's going to execute it. So it's a self-executing function, basically, kind of like using something in C Sharp. So go back here. So just as a brief overview again. <coughs> You have entry points in your program, and you may have just one entry point. You may have like a central app.js, or you may have multiple entry points, different things that you're going to want to bundle up as part of your Webpack configuration. Then you have your output, which is where your entry is going to get bundled out to. You have loaders, which are kind of in between the two. They're telling the entry how to become the output, interpreting whatever's in your files. Plugins are doing kind of helper tasks, um, things that aren't quite loaders, but they are necessary as part of that process. And then the mode is just your environment, and you have to be on IE8 or, or newer, unless you're going to use Babel, 
which is very straightforward. You just toss it in the config file and it works. I didn't test on IE8 though, so I may be wrong. <laughs> um, so I made this little GitHub repo and it's, it's essentially based on, I went through the webpack getting started and I went through a couple of these. I didn't go through quite all of them, quite all of them because there's like over 20 <laughs> different little sub tutorials you could go through. Um, some of the more advanced stuff like tree shaking, <clears throat> don't fully flesh it out because it's based on specific use cases in your application. Um, but it does a lot of stuff. So it'd be worth kind of going through this if you're interested looking at your own time. But to get started, the first thing I did here, I'm going to make this bigger, is just make a directory to put your project in, initialize a node package, and then install Webpack. So up here, this is kind of what my folder structure looks like for the initial example. Make sure I'm on the right tag and get. So I go to the getting started section. And I'll run npm install. I'll take just a second. And uh, if you haven't used tags before, they're basically just like bookmarks. Um, you, you can only have one tag of the same name in a particular repo history, but it just appends itself to a commit. So now if I looked at the log, you would see that I'm on the getting started tag of this commit, which tells me that this is the point where I stopped the getting started tutorial. So anyways, back in here, um, the entry point uh, essentially is this webpack.config where I've told it I have this, which is the default, but I'm just explicitly defining it. It's even bigger, I think. But, and then I have an output, which I'm going to name main.js, and I'm going to put it in this disk directory, which you can see here. Um, now, if I were to do a git clean, which deletes anything that wasn't there by default. Let's see, you'll see that the dist directory is still there just because I manually added this HTML file, but there's nothing else in there. There's not like a bundle.js. And if I were to load this, it'll give me an error saying loading failed for that script. So to get this up and running, all you have to do is npx, which is basically saying execute this against your current uh, node project, webpack. And it knows by default. I don't have to say dash dash config and webpack.config.js. It just knows by default that that's going to be the name. npx is not recognized. That's a phone. An issue to have. I think I have to do it from this PowerShell window. NPX webpack. Yeah, it's running in this one. I just installed all this stuff on this computer a few minutes ago. So right here, it's seeing there were some missing packages after I did that clean. So it's going ahead and installing stuff for me that was missing, basically restoring the packages, kind of like a NuGet package. And once that runs, it's going to show some output that shows basically what was generated from what and what kind of file sizes you ended up with, which is good if you're trying to target like some max page size for load speeds or things like that. Almost there. Okay. One CLI webpack must be installed. Okay. This is a classic thing you run into with node applications, just waiting for the packages to install. And it's surprising how big some of them are too. They, they end up in like the node modules with 200 directories <laughs> deep. Claims I can't find it, but it is still thinking about it. Um, 
So another thing to look at in here, though, um, basically I only have this one reference. I have this reference to the main.js. And uh, I'm going to show in the next example, if you had an index.js, normally you would have to have some import in the HTML. So traditionally you might see, say you're importing jQuery. Um, you would see in the head up here, maybe import all your external library type things. And then the bottom, you would reference your custom scripts. But here I just have main.js. So it's, it's actually compiling these together. And once I get that to build, you'll see it's, it's taking that Lodash library and just putting the entire contents into the JavaScript file. So it's actually combining them into one file. So npx webpack. Maybe this time I'll get it. There we go. So this is the standard output you typically see after you've run a webpack bundling. You'll see the time that it took, which was about six and a half seconds. Um, the time that you did it, all sorts of stuff. Um, if you wanted, you could configure that to go out to a log file. I'm not getting that crazy with it tonight, but um, you've got here your index.js, which was 230 bytes. And then these things are actually related to, I believe, the import and then the module. So let's go back here. And you'll see it spit out this main.js, which is just a bunch of minified goop. But you look in here. Um, and I search for Lodash, you'll see that Lodash was actually injected in there directly. So if you had other things, you could do it in order, and it's actually going to do them in the order that you import them, which is good for knowing what's running at what times. And it gets all these other things like underscore, that's a requirement, um, but basically any, any prerequisites that are also required by whatever you're importing. So like Bootstrap sometimes, if you're ever using Bootstrap's JavaScript stuff, they'll have you import Popper and Strap JS and jQuery, and you have to know what order you're doing those in. So this is kind of taking care of that sort of logic and just compiling them. So the next example I had is starting to get into something more relevant. It's got asset management. So let's go here. So if I go back to my config and look for what's different here, I'll make this a hard reset. Okay, so it's a little bit longer now. And basically what I've added is I've still got that same entry point. I've got an output point, which is bundle.js, still bundling out to the same thing. It renamed it, so it's no longer called main.js. And then I've started to add what, what they call rules. And these are where your loaders come into play. So I've got a style loader that I'm using to import CSS via JavaScript. I've got an image loader that I'm using to load images. Um, and then I'm using the same loader from the images to load these font files. And then a CSV loader and XML loader. So it's just different types of things, data, fonts, images, and CSS. And you can import these with normal JavaScript syntax. So you've got the one from before, importing Lodash. Um, it's importing style.css. And this syntax should look familiar from that Babel example. Um, it's self-executing. So it's going to go ahead and take that style CSS and put it where it needs to go to run in that module. And then icon. This is going to be pulling in a picture as a HTML image element object. And then data, this will, this will come through as a JSON object that you can then work with. So I'm going to do the same thing as before, except this time I've, I've moved that npx webpack into a standard kind of package.json build script. The output will look very similar. but you've got a lot more lines here. 
So um, we still have this kind of JS file that we've emitted out of it, but you've also got these random characters of strings and numbers. And so as it renders these, it's actually changing the name here um, to make sure it's globally unique so it can put it in the dist folder. And then it's compressing it, doing anything else that you might want to do to it, like minification. And then it shows here what you had to start with. So you can see this was 83 bytes originally, this WAF file. And now it is 84.7 kilobytes. So I think it's more bytes. <laughs> um, regardless, but you can, you can put other things in the process, um, kind of like middleware that you could then use if you were really going for compression. So let me load this page. And it looks really weird. It's not made to look fancy or anything. But I've injected some CSS. So I have this, this file being read. Um, I've got that data showing up in the console. And then it's a little bit weird. I've got like an actual image element here. And then everything else is a background image injected through CSS. So these are just a few different ways you could load content um, of any type, not just JavaScript libraries, but loading images, CSS, JavaScript, and having it all managed through the JavaScript so you know what your structure looks like from that one file. OK. And let me see if there's anything else interesting in here. Bundle. The bundle is very similar. It's just kind of minified together. You've got these images. So it's the same images from before, but they've just been put here um, with these globally unique IDs that are then kind of being referenced behind the scenes to, to get them where they need to go. And then package.json. The other thing I added here is just this, just says Webpack. So anytime that I run npm run build, it's going to do that. The rest of that's just out of the box default. And one more example here. Um, oh, there's two more. But is output management. So switch to that. And so this one here, go back to our Webpack config. Um, I've got two entry points now. And I've named them explicitly. So I no longer just have one index.js that I'm compiling with Webpack. I've got an app.js and a print.js. And print is going to print something. And then app's going to manage the application, load the resources, and things like that. And then these are some plugins. So this is the first time of using some plugins. Um, clean Webpack plugin is going to take the disk directory and remove anything that doesn't need to be in there whenever I run this. And then HTML Webpack actually generates the index HTML. So if you wanted, you could integrate that with some objects, have some templates, maybe view CLI, mix some stuff together, and actually generate your HTML through here. And then manifest is going to spit out a file that tells me what exactly was, was spit out on that build event. And that way I can just have that as a log on the file system. And then output, this syntax here is abstracting it out. It's got a dynamic name that it's going to get from here. So app.bundle.js and print.bundle.js. And then everything else is pretty much the same in there. Um, and here, I've imported the print file, called it print me, and then wired up some events. And then in the print, all it, do, all it does is just exports this function to get itself called and logged to the console. So npm run build. So you'll see it's, it's removing stuff that we had in the disk directory from the last build. And then going through here, made the app.bundle and the print.bundle, generated a JSON file with the manifest of what was actually rendered, and then generated an index.html file. And this is all just based on the JavaScript. So I didn't have to have any other 
um, static resources in there to generate all that. So I'll refresh this page. This big up here. And so it's actually showing me um, another thing that's kind of interesting here. It's showing me oh, that's the next example. So right now it's just looking at the minified files. So if you were to want to debug this, it would show you one line for the whole file. Um, the next example I have, whenever you spit stuff out to the console, it'll show you the line from the original file. It'll map it for you. So, and then this, this index.html was generated from Webpack. So, using that plugin. And then here, this is like a JSON object that I use to generate what type of data is going to go into the, the, the site. So the title is going to be that. And then you could, you could extend that, whatever you would need. Um, okay. Last example I've got. So this is, once you've gotten something put together and uh, you've got something you want to work with, but you need to keep developing it, you're probably going to get tired of hitting NPM run build every time you continue working on things. And this is kind of a classic dilemma with stuff like SAS or uh, even TypeScript. You know, you want to, you want to, every time you hit save, maybe refreshes the browser, compiles your stuff. So to do that, you have to have some sort of a server running to watch, like a watch task. So I'm going to set that up here. Reset to that tag and install the packages again. And okay. So I've added um, inline source map. So that's the other thing I mentioned it to get the right line numbers in the console. And then I've added a dev server that's going to render out stuff to the dist directory. And then all these plugins are the same as before. All this stuff's the same as before. I've added this server, which is, this is a, it's just copy paste a template from an express application. Um, but this is just something for the JavaScript to run on. It's like the, the underlying platform that it's going to run that, that logic against. Then index.js, same as before, basically. The print.js, the same as before. So the only thing we've added is we've added this dev server. We've added the server.js, telling it to, to use the config file. And then we've added in the package some more scripts just to simplify what we're hitting. So npm run server. That's what we're going to want to type. And then all of a sudden it's running node server.js. It's going to run all the initial stuff. And it's starting a web server, so it has to get approval to run on the network. May not let but you can see here it's the same output from before, but it's going to do this every time that I hit save. So you see it's still in the process. It's not back to the normal command line. So if I go in here to print.js and I misspell this, which is actually the example they do, as soon as I did that over here, you see it pops some stuff up. It's kind of jumping a little bit. It's re-rendering things. Let me refresh this page. What we have here. Console. We run the initial build first. Okay, and then the server. So that's weird. It doesn't seem to be going the right place. But that's kind of the idea that um, if you wanted to have something where you're saving, and every time you're saving, it's doing the bundling, as opposed to having to manually basically build it every time, you would have these things here. Um, running a server, which then uses this stuff, run the middleware. So that middleware is available. Um, 
as you know, another way that you could use Webpack. And go back here. So I was at this section here, development. Interesting. Yeah. So they've got a lot of other examples here. Um, these ones, some of them get into a little more advanced uses, like hot module replacement, where you're, you know, figuring out at runtime what packages need to get injected, like dependency injection, um, while you're running the page. Tree shaking is basically looking through and seeing what parts of the libraries aren't being used. So like if you import jQuery, but you only use the Ajax features of jQuery, it would remove everything else that jQuery brings in to save on load times, which is a really big one. Whoa. Yeah. And that's, that's a fairly new feature in Webpack 2. Um, and this one I wasn't able to get running. Um, it was like midnight last night, so I ordered it and done all the other ones. But um, they show this basic example. You've got a square function and cube function, and you only use the cube function. So it gets rid of the square function altogether. And uh, when you spit it out, it minifies everything and removes what you're not using. Um, other stuff they've got here, code splitting. This is kind of a concept of lazy loading but they've actually implemented it so that you can lazy load your JavaScript itself. So as opposed to just lazy loading images or parts of the page, like waiting for someone to scroll down, you could actually say, well, when they load the page, I really only need this logic, but I don't want to make a whole separate file just to get this other logic at this, this different point in the page lifecycle. Kind of like you've got your page pre-render event, on init event, on load event in ASP. You basically do that here with code splitting. And that gets, again, a little, little more complicated stuff in, in Webpack, but it has those capabilities for you. Some caching concepts. Um, and the other thing is, you know how it gave you those GUIDs for the images when you spit those out? Um, it can actually regenerate those if you need to break a cache, since the cache is name-based. If you're ever downloading pictures or CSS files, and then you make a change to a CSS file, but it's still named styles.css, that's kind of what it's doing there. It's, it's giving you a way that you could break the cache if you needed to um, on the client side without having to tell them, open the window in incognito and clear your cache. These are just like a few small things that it does. But um, it's definitely something that I'd like to learn more about and I'm planning to hopefully use for part of a personal project for a new website redesign. But I think that's pretty much all I've got. So you used Gulp before, right? <clears throat> yeah, I've used Gulp. Do you find this to be, it seems to be a little bit, until you get into yeah. the um, hot module loading and the tree shaking, yeah. it seems to be a little bit even easier to set up than, uh, especially, I mean, it has all the tutorials to walk through, whereas Gulp's just like, here you go, good luck, sort of. I think um, once you've done Gulp once, it probably is a little bit faster, depending on what you're trying to accomplish with it. Because you've only got one type of thing with Gulp, it's task. Mm -hmm. Whereas here you've got loaders, and then you've got the concept of plugins, and they're doing kind of different things. All well, that piping crap with Gulp yeah. is just so, damn, you know, just so it's much. It's kind of like link syntax. Yeah. It's, uh, I, can, I can appreciate both of them. But I, I'm seeing that this one is definitely a lot more full-featured than Gulp. Um, it has a lot more uh, possibilities of what you could do. Um, Gulp's just doing JavaScript stuff, you know, like, maybe compiling some SAS, but this is actually dealing with, uh, not that you couldn't do it in Gulp per se, but it's dealing with things like images and uh, <clears throat> more of the module level inside of it. Um, the biggest competitor is probably RequireJS, if you've ever heard of that one. Um, they were one of the first ones in the field for module loading, and they definitely have better support on the older browsers, but they've basically taken what they liked and disliked about RequireJS and modernized it. So in JavaScript, you almost have an advantage being a newer, you know, newer framework. That's why this new framework's like every every year. Yeah. Um, because you can build on the newest features, and then now that they've got stuff like Babel, you can just compile it down, and it magically somehow works in IE. <laughs> so, but uh, it's it's definitely if you're using Webpack, you probably wouldn't want to use Gulp as well. I think that's a problem I've seen in a lot of projects is 
having a gulp file and using gulp for some things, but then using other Visual Studio extensions for other things like compilers and bundlers and gulp and then Webpack maybe thrown in there. Um, so it's definitely you'd want to pick one. And I think if you're doing that, this, this has a lot of potential for, for being the one thing that handles all the JavaScript. It requires the other um, um, competitor. Is there? Yeah. Is Webpack it? That's what I keep reading. Is it's <laughs> it's the best by by far the best. I think if you were to Google module bundling right now, it's probably going to be one of the first ones that comes up. Um, it's newer, which has pros and cons. Um, but I think Require JS. Um, if you look at the comparison on Webpack site, everything is almost identical. But then they've added like one little thing on top of it. So anything you could have done in require JS, you can do in Webpack for sure. But then they've added things on top of it. So it, it's kind of like a superset of it. Is require going to be like, oh, hell no, and come back and <laughs> trump it? And then eventually it'll be, I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me if they merged at some point. Um, other, other projects have done that. Like I know TypeScript and Angular. Mm -hmm. You know, Angular was wanting to do things that TypeScript wasn't doing, and now Angular is written in TypeScript. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's one of those things that isn't mutually exclusive. Um, they could eventually combine those in theory. <clears throat> that part about yanking out everything in jQuery except for uh, Ajax is yeah fantastic, and that's incredible. It's a huge load, page load savings. Too. Yeah, that's all you really use it for anymore. And you can do that on a module by module basis. So if you have, say, a, a home page and you've got your scripts for the home page all bundled up, but then you've got a contact page and you need more stuff because you're doing form validation, um, you could do the same library and have it tree shaking depending on which month, which um, bundle you're loading. Um, so it'll spit out, you know, a module for the home page and a module for the contact page. And it's going to take the same source stuff um, you don't have to have like multiple copies of jQuery saved somewhere, or multiple links to it. Um, it's just going to know that while it's compiling. Um, basically giving you the advantages of a compiled language while you're still using a scripting language, JavaScript. Pretty cool. Yeah, super cool. I wonder how hard it would be to hook that up with uh, <clears throat> like ASP.NET, like if you're doing MVC app. And you yeah. uh, JavaScript and stuff in it. I'm sure there's a way you could hook up Webpack in there. I mean, they have their own bundling system or whatever, yeah. but you could probably use Webpack instead. Well, the, in Visual Studio, I know the Task Runner Explorer, well, when you're running Gulp files, for example, <coughs> um, you can bind Gulp tasks. I would assume you can do the same thing with your Webpack build events, because um, mm -hmm. it's like you can have an NPM run build that's the standard syntax. Um, so I would assume you would probably do it as maybe a post build event or some, something along those lines and just have it in there, a little PowerShell scriptlet or whatever, say NPM run build and then you're done. And then everything else would come from your config files. That project that I was on where we used all that, they used Yarn instead yeah. of NPM. Yeah, there's like Yarn, Bower, uh, Yeti, there's, there's something like that. <laughs> But it was like yarn everything, yarn start, yeah. yarn build, yarn test. I know that's the syntax I believe that Docker uses as well. Um, I think the Docker file is somehow related to yarn, or they use some yarn components in that. Um, but it's kind of the same ideas. Is, is yarn, is it another Facebook spinoff or something? I don't know if it's so Facebook like really. React, I think it React Facebook. I think Yarn is yeah. Facebook. React is Facebook for sure. And I think Yarn is too. And that's why I think we were using it we were doing React. And, and if you follow the React like tutorials and all, uh, they yeah. tell you to use Yarn. Yeah. Next thing they'll have Facebook uh, GitHub clone. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, Facebook open source or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, bootstrap comes from Twitter, I guess, yeah. you know. Yeah, the, the, the reason I started looking at Webpack was in part because I know Tim mentioned it because, you know, you've worked on that React project. And then I'm doing a redesign for a, I do wedding photography and videography. 
and uh, we had a friend who's a graphic designer, just graduated from UWF and works for Hilton Hotels, Industry Hotels, um, do a rebranding, like logo, color schemes and stuff. And then I'm just making a web website out of it. So looking at how to be more of the nerd side of that as opposed to marketing. <laughs> uh, stuff like Webpack and Bulma is another one I was looking at. I, I overheard Todd talking about it. It's a, basically an alternative to Bootstrap uh, CSS framework, but a little more lean and modular. Uh, Bootstrap's too opinionated for me. Yeah. I'm not you overheard him talking about it. Man, you, you have yeah. good ears. But yeah, you don't watch this guy, man. We tease him about it. <laughs> I'll mention something. I'll he get something. hear you whisper something <laughs> downstairs around the corner. <laughs> so fast. I don't even get the sentence out. And when you get up there, you start telling everybody, so, oh, I'm already doing that. <laughs> 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 But uh, I, what was the other the view? View is a big one. Yeah. yeah, that one's coming becoming popular now. That was um, I, I did a presentation on that like last year, or maybe in the summertime this year. But uh, yeah, view is a good one. It's very minimalistic. Is yeah. another big thing about it. You, you can have just a little bit of view, or you can have all of you and make it a view application. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but you could also just use it to render out basically handlebars templates. Mm -hmm. I think the most popular framework right now is React. Yeah. Probably, probably a lower learning curve. curve than I, don't like that. Mm -hmm. I think you might take it over eventually. But I'm, yeah. keep, I'm waiting to see what's going to happen with Blazor. Yeah. That's this is C-sharp turning into really JavaScript. Or what are you going to do with that? Heard of Blazor. It's supposed to be an alternative to JavaScript. Oh, C-sharp. Made by Microsoft. Yeah. Oh, fuck that. They take it. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, scratch it. They take the dot .NET. Yeah. Oh, wow. They take the dot .NET framework <laughs> and they pilot it um, um, web assembly. Yeah. They use web assembly to compile the dot .NET framework. So basically, instead of doing JavaScript, you just do everything in C Sharp on your page. Which and that's it, what everyone liked about JavaScript was the theory that you could use Node and have that on your back end and the JavaScript on your front end. It's all built on it's all JavaScript. Yeah. Is what to have to transpile into JavaScript because you're not replacing JavaScript. JavaScript has probably the largest and strongest foothold of any language out there right now. Last yeah. year it was Stack Overflow's number one language. Yeah, now it's like really? Python or something like that. But, like, but the Blazor is not a uh, it's not it's not mm -hmm. really it, it's not even built on JavaScript or anything. It's totally its own web assembly thing. Yeah. yeah. Is it on client side or server side? Both. It, and they said when you compile it, they've actually got it so that it, it, a lot of it's coming out smaller than JavaScript. What type of support does it have? It's all just experimental right now. The Internet Explorer. <laughs> no, they said it runs on every browser. Edge. Don't forget about Edge. Every every browser <laughs> browser now implements WebAssembly, so it'll run on every one of them. I'm just interested to see how it's going to come out. It'll probably be dead two years away. <laughs> it'll take five. It'll take pretty, five to, get <laughs> they, to work on Internet Explorer on a Windows phone. <laughs> Uh, I was just like, that's the one that frustrates me about Microsoft. About something in two but a lot of this stuff <laughs> now, like like um, VS Code, yeah, most popular, even the Mac people and all them are using it now. But nobody's using Sublime and all that. I can't anymore. believe how good it is. I really, it is. I really can't. It is. By the way, it's written in TypeScript. Yeah. It's, I can't. It's, it's what it's Sublime awesome. should have been or something. But it's also because no, Microsoft it's, it's is Electron. To open source. It's based on mm -hmm. Electron JS is what they wrote it. They were, they were advertising something that it was. But it might be TypeScript with Electron. Yeah, because Electron's JavaScript apps. Yeah, that's what Slack is made. Desktop application. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that's why it runs on every platform because it's yeah. basically run on JavaScript. Yeah, I was diehard sublime, and then I uh, started doing a tutorial. It was like, well, it's easier to set up your linting if you just use um, yeah. Visual Studio. I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. And do it like that. Just everybody loves it. It's it's the best. So, I, I mean, use. you can't really bad mouth them too bad no more. They're just coming around. Just all the dumb shit they do, like I don't know. 
They're not consistent in quality across everything. Yes, sometimes I get backwards. Like we're we are we've been using like a newer TFS and the original TFS. Like things like we used to like use like a calendar that um, migrated into Outlook, so we would like put our PTO RDO and stuff like that. So it would all the TFS. So when people would do like planning. They would look and see what everybody's schedule was like. Well, the new TFS, like they redid the calendar. It looks like crap. It doesn't integrate like with Outlook or whatever. It's just like what 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 happened here? You know, like, <laughs> Hi, why would you do? Why would you do this to somebody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always saying that about my. Like, why yeah. the fuck would you? Why would you do this? Yeah. Why wouldn't? Why wouldn't you name it? Alberto has been spying on us the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious. He must not have a microphone. But yeah. any uh, things y'all want to hear about on a future topic? More view. More view. Or blazer. That'd be cool. Why don't you yeah. mention like uh, yeah, dude. I think you should mention that Docker last time. That would be a cool subject. Yeah. That's one thing I've looked at, but I just never really understood it completely. Yeah. Isn't it about Docker containers? Deployment and yeah, it's a virtualization. Basically. In theory, you could have full Windows VMs on Docker. But it's it's more ideal for things like Linux applications with it. Use MongoDB or mm -hmm. stuff that takes you a little bit. Of pretty much anything in a container these days, because Microsoft has fully like embraced it, and so like everything now on Windows will go out today. A lot of people are running Kubernetes pods or clusters or whatever. We're building. Them application now that's supposed to be cross-platform you know and like you know we'll eventually want to be able to have easy ways to test across multiple yeah and stuff like that you know it seems like a like that might be something we might want to look at <laughs> well the good thing about it is you can set it up and then you can take that container and you can stick it on the, you can set it up on windows mm -hmm. and then take that container and stick it on a linux server mm -hmm. and then it still run yeah, size is another thing. It's it's uh, significantly smaller. I think. Or you can write it in .NET Core. Yeah. 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 We have like, well, the, the I know, I know, I know. Yeah. You can put all of the dependencies in there. Yeah, there. absolutely. And then you just have that one container. You say, here you go, and you just start it up. Yeah. And it runs. I, I actually did use it in college for my capstone because um, we did a node applicant node based Express web application that was doing document versioning. So it's like you, uh, kind of like what Google Docs does, but it's on a very small. It's like a common thing that they do that. Like somebody else I was talking to said that they did the same thing. Well, they, they give you these prompts in your capstone project at UWF, and they you can choose your own prompt if the professor likes it, or you can choose this one that some other professor has been working on. And so a lot of times they get repeated if they don't like one year's project. Maybe they yeah. didn't like ours. Or, um, or it's like there's phases, and they have a really big problem they want to solve. So they take several semesters worth of capstone students and they give them each a little chunk of it and they each solve some small part of it for their capstone. Smart. So mine was, well, the idea of mine was actually supposed to be for an antivirus program. They wanted to be able to check versions of files on the file system and then know if a change has happened, who made the change and why the change was made. So I was just doing change tracking with files, but then, and it was a web app, so it would run, you know, universally. Mm -hmm. But someone else would need to transfer that to, you know, navigating a network maybe or things like that. But you could, uh, yeah, the, the, what we did with Docker, though, was the other people didn't really know much about, like, Node, installing Node packages, then... Uh, getting a Mongo daemon running to use MongoDB because there's no SQL based, like a document database. Um, getting Lucene up and running to do t full text search. So Docker, you could have all that in the Docker file and they just have one command. It's Docker build or something. Yeah. And then it would set up the MongoDB daemon inside the container, have some port network translation, stuff like that. Well, there are options. Yeah. Um, so if you have like two or more dependencies of some sort, like say a database and a server. Yeah. You know, and they're self-contained. It's not like a separate database server. Then you'd want to use something like, like Docker to encapsulate them. Ooh. Yeah, you're a good presenter. Any shit, anything you want to talk about. <laughs> good. Well we'll have uh, we'll have Pete next month.
So uh, oh, yeah. make sure you bring Apple products. Sounds like Johnny Ive. <laughs> <laughs> um, British accent, translate yeah, like a bunch of British flags. I think he actually like hates Britain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, then February we'll see what happens, and we'll move to uh, six thirty going forward if that's good with with y'all. Yeah, I don't have to rush as much. As yeah. And then next year, I'm going to make it a goal to start live streaming and recording and, you know, having a little more publicity with it. If whoever's speaking, you know, that's available. I, I was hesitant at first, though, because I know sometimes it can be like an excuse to not come. <laughs> oh, you get the pizza, though. You can't yeah. eat pizza first. Yeah. <laughs> we'll care about pizza. But. It's a little tricky because someone could RSVP, yes, but they mean they're going to live stream. So you don't really know how many people are going right. to be there. Yeah, it seems like there ought to be like a third option, like whether or not you're going to do it all. How do you get more people to come to these things? That's, that's the question. The yeah. answer right there. Well, it's it's been as much as, you know, this table being full and not having enough seats. And it's been as little as one time Mike was presenting and I was the only one and then one other coworker came. And it was like. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. What's your percent on? Can I go cloud? Mm. Good one too. I presented a few times before, but I don't know, ten, eight years ago or so, we used to get 25 pieces of the movie. Yeah. We would even, they would even have speakers that would come through on circuits and stuff and come to stop and talk. And yeah. That's how, the, that type of community is talking way down. Really? We're around here? <laughs> yeah. I was Bank of America when I was over in that building. Oh, that's really surprising. I used to Microsoft, do. they used to have stuff like we would do a raffle right now and, and give out yeah. copies of Windows 10 and, and mm-hmm. this, that, and the other. That's what they did in your I did the <laughs> SQL Server users group in Pensacola, and they yeah. were the same way. They would have speaker like every time, and they would give away books. Or, so they've got that guy from Birmingham. Uh, but then the lady that was running it, she yeah, I could see any graph having like a huge, yeah, they, they a got, huge got, community. Yeah, they got, they got auditorium. I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. It was pretty cool. Yeah. They moved away. They moved to Texas or something. <laughs> yeah, she actually applied to you work at Intergraph? No, I worked. Uh, I just yeah, knew that they had that group or whatever. And, uh, mm-hmm. I was going to take a job there, but. Yeah. Oh, I know it was. They're both working for companies in yeah. Texas, but they yeah. did. Several friends are up there, you know. Uh, yeah, it was almost going to be a GIS program. <laughs> He's yeah. a, I guess that would have been interesting. Oracle. Oracle, working in Oracle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I've heard something about that. And then she just. Oh, yeah. Mass. I don't know, she does a little yeah. bit of everything, I think. So. Well, my buddy, he works in a. She's good at school. organizing events. That's what she's good at. Yeah. Like, yeah. And you know what? That may have been the area I was going to get into. Whatever is down here is Motorola, because I work for Motorola in the same industry. Oh, okay. City government. Yeah. Uh, I said it was blowing that they get around SQL Saturdays. Yeah. There, are, there are people that literally yeah. travel around to all those yeah. events. Yeah. And it's one of the best local yeah. events like, they do. You know, like if you're in the city, you know, you see Hammers and stuff like that. They, you know, like, you know, get your like Hammers or just. Oh, yeah. Have all kinds of stuff like that, or whatever. Yeah. And I don't know how much she's paying them, if anything. I don't. I don't think they get paid. Was part of the pass. She was she something to do with the entire building team. Yeah. Pass. And that was the meetup thing, or whatever was what she did, like on the side for them there in Pensacola. Yeah, that was an interesting company. More pass. Basically setting up events, yeah. yeah. And then um, she a lot of educated people. Oh yeah. yeah. She eventually yeah, quit the, 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 the group. Pretty much like if you're looking for a. Uh,